We're here today because improvements in agriculture can make an enormous difference. Now, here in Senegal and across Africa, most people are employed in agriculture. And we know that compared to other sectors, growth in agriculture is far more effective in reducing poverty, including among women. Part of why this work is so important is because if you want broad-based economic growth uh, in a country like Senegal, starting with these small-scale farmers, putting more income into their pockets uh, ensures that you know, it's not just a few who are benefiting uh, from development, but everybody's benefiting, and it makes an enormous difference. That's why when I took office, uh, we took at new ways that we could provide assistance and partner with countries, and we decided to make food security a priority. We helped mobilize uh, the leading economies uh, around the world on this mission. In the United States, we launched our new initiative called Feed the Future, which works in partnership with 12 African countries. We know this works. Uh, today, we're going to be releasing a report that shows progress so far under Feed the Future. We've already helped 7 million small farmers harness new techniques. We've boosted the value of their goods uh, that they sell by more than $100 million, and that means higher incomes for farmers and more opportunities for farmers. You know, in a place like Ethiopia, we've been hearing about farmers who, who are getting new loans, sometimes for small, mechanized products like this that can make all the difference. One farmer said this salary changed his life. Uh, because, you know, he was able now to send his child to school. But well, we're seeing some of these new technologies that will unleash even more progress. That includes how farmers here in Senegal are using their cell phones to share data so they get the best price when they bring their products to market. I met with a young woman farmer who had started off with one hectare, now has 16. She has been able to uh, achieve enough growth that she's now bought a tractor. She's hired eight people. Now, we, that's not what we ordinarily think of as business or entrepreneurship. But if you think about the number of Africans who are involved in agriculture and giving them the tools where suddenly they're getting better prices for their crops, they've got access to a marketplace, they now are getting enough credit to be able to mechanize their operations. And now suddenly they're able to hire some people in their surrounding villages. You've just suddenly seen a small business grow. When people uh, ask what's happening to their taxpayer dollars and uh, foreign aid, I want people to know this money's not being wasted. It's helping feed families. It's helping people uh, to become more self-sufficient. And it's creating new markets for U.S. companies and U.S. goods. It's a win-win situation. Good morning. Welcome, excellencies, guests, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, to the first ever Feed the Future Global Forum. I'm Jada McKenna, the Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future based at USAID. Um, I, along with Jonathan Schreier, my counterpart at the State Department, are absolutely honored to have you here today. There are nearly 30 countries representing six continents in the room with us here today which is quite appropriate because at its core, Feed the Future is driven by country priorities, partnership, and a deep commitment to catalyzing growth through development of the agricultural sector. Over the next three days, we will celebrate the tremendous achievements made in the four years since Feed the Future implementation began, inspired by the G8 L'Aquila Summit. We will hear from senior officials and field practitioners with firsthand example of results to date and the lessons learned from those accomplishments. We will also have honest engagement on the barriers overcome, best practices, and what it will take 
to further accelerate success in the years ahead. Today, we will focus on progress, remind people what Feed the Future is and what we're aiming to do, um, and how far we've come, how we've changed the way we work within the, with the US government at USAID and other agencies to achieve against these tremendous goals that we've set for ourselves and in a way that does business and development differently. Tomorrow's agenda is really an opportunity for more interaction between you to really build an emphasis on the deep requ engagement required across multiple sectors and the need to more effectively connect resources and strategic approaches to maximize impact. And on Wednesday, we'll focus on the road ahead and what, we, what it will take to accelerate progress in addressing old problems and rising to new challenges. We can't stop here. We must further progress for sustainability, especially considering the growing threat of climate change in a world with more people and limited natural resources. The path we continue to pave here can map the direction for future leaders, and I'm thrilled that we have university fellows and Peace Corps volunteers with us here. I'll be brief and close by saying thank you. Thank you for your leadership and commitment. In one of my earliest trips to Southern Africa, I visited a rural community. Um, and in that community, people were farmers, everyone farmed. Yet I saw a woman and her young child. The child was obviously malnourished and the child kept on reaching for its mother for more food and there was not food there to be given. That touched me forever. It set me on the course that I've, I've had, the course of my career. Um, it's the reason why I'm here today. And I think it's the reason many of you are here today. We are all here because we share a common goal to end hunger, poverty, and undernutrition. Together, we have made a difference and we will continue to make that difference together. We will really truly make a lasting impact. I'm pleased to introduce Shangan Fan to help us set the stage here to describe the state of global food security. Dr. Fan is the Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, otherwise known as IFPRI, uh, to those of us who work with them very closely. He serves as the chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Food Security and Nutrition, and he is a recipient of the World Food Program's Hunger Hero Award. Dr. Fan, thank you, and then welcome to Well, thank you, Data. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Raj, uh, Senator Muga, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It will be really my great honor just to, to very briefly give you some sort of overview of the status of global food and nutrition security. Uh, I have a slide somewhere. Okay, great. So, very brief. So, we have made a tremendous progress but the challenges remain, particularly after 2007, 2008 food crisis. So many people fell into poverty and hunger. We took a lot of actions. We made a tremendous progress, but more progress is needed. Then the policies and investment responded to that crisis. And I will touch some sort of um, further actions we needed to make sure that we can end hunger and malnutrition uh, let's say by 2025 or 2030. So finally, building resilience is crucial to end hunger and undernutrition, undernutrition by 2025. I just came back from a very large gathering in Addis Ababa where the 800 people spoke on this topic. The Prime Minister of Ethiopia, African Union leadership, and also leaders from various African governments uh, came together to look at how we can build a resilience. Many of you in this room actually also came, from, came uh, to this conference on the same flight. Now, for, so for the last uh, two or three decades, we have made a tremendous progress. In 1990, we had about a one billion people who suffered from malnutrition or undernourishment. Today, or in 2000, 2012, it was about 827. Yes, the number is still very large, we are not on track of the target set by the uh, uh, World Food Security Summit in 1995. It, the target was reduced by half, 500 million. And look at the percentage. 
in, 19, in 1990, the global food, uh, global, uh, the percentage of the people who are suffering from hunger was about 20, uh, let's say 24%. Uh, today, the percentage should be about uh, uh, 12 or 13%, but we are not on target, but tremendous progress has been made. Particularly across different regions, the, the, the progress has not been uneven. Look at Africa, South Asia. So Africa, 25% of the population is still undernourished. Uh, in South Asia, it's about 20%. Tremendous progress has been made in Southeast Asia and Asia. So right now, the large percentage of hungry people are in South Asia and Africa. There's another hunger called a hidden hunger, that is a lack, lack of micronutrients, uh, lack of vitamins in your diet. You don't observe you're hungry, but that sort of hunger is particularly damaging to your mental and the physical health. So right now, 70, 79% of people in Asia is zinc uh, deficient, so the children under five. Then iron deficiency uh, and uh, the deficiency of, micro, uh, of vitamin A's are particularly severe in many African, African countries in South Asia. Child malnutrition is widespread. The stunting, the stunting under five. Look at the South Asia. 40% of children are stunt. In, uh, in, in Africa, it's 37%. So you know the damage to children uh, is particularly large if they are stunt, if they are uh, undernourished or malnourished. So at EPRI, we did a study to, to estimate the cost and benefit ratio, ratios of investment in cutting down hunger and malnutrition. The returns are very high. Look at the chart on the right-hand side. On average, $1 invested in cutting down hunger and malnutrition, $30 will be returned. So where can you find that kind of investment? One to 30. So if you put your money in the bank, so what kind of return you can get? Much lower than that. Higher food prices and the volatility continue. We know that in 2007, 2008, food prices went up by 100%, 200% within six months, within 12 months. But today the volatility has not come down. Food prices will continue to be very high. Again, it pro projected that from now to uh, 2050, major food commodity crop will increase by 30 to 50 percent. We are not afraid of higher food prices, but we don't like is volatility. Yes, we have made lots of um, actions, or we propose lots of actions to deal with food price crisis. Increase investment in agriculture, food and nutrition. Yes, we have made progress. Decrease the use of trade restrictions, you know, export bans. Yes, we also made tremendous prog progress on that. They increased national stocks and the reserves. We made some progress, but progress, more progress is needed. However, we, not ha we have not made much progress on the competition between food and the fuel. We have not made much progress to reduce the dis uh, distortionary and the costly price support policies. So this policy usually increase price volatility. And we have not made much progress to introduce social protection system to protect the poor when the crisis came. And obviously, we have not made much progress in supporting climate change adaptation and mitigation activities. Investment, I just wanted to highlight the progress we have made. Many countries, particularly emerging economies, have increased their investment in agriculture, Brazil, India, China, and beyond. CADA, African leaders came together in 2003, committed 10% of their national budget to support agriculture. It was 4% in 2003. Today is more than 6%. Yes, very far away from 10%, but tremendous progress has been made. 26 countries have developed investment plan you know, if the 10% budget is allocated, 30 countries have signed the, the compact. And uh, in June this year, or July, the African leaders will come together to make the further commitment to develop agriculture 
donors, including the United States G8. After the 2007-2008 food crisis, the G8 committed $22 billion to support agricultural, nutrition, food security, the new alliance for food, for secure, food secure and nutrition, Feed the Future Initiative, all these were great initiatives. And I particularly wanted to congratulate the U.S. government in introducing the Feed of the Future. And last year, the United Kingdom committed uh, together with stakeholders, not only government, the private sector committed $4.15 billion uh, for a global nutrition for growth compact. So nutrition for growth. Nutrition is a moral issue, but also is economic, uh, makes a lot of economic sense. Just some highlights on the Feed of the Future. So IPRI has been working together with the USID as a partner to support you. For example, this new alliance of food, uh, this is the Hub's Choice platform, where they can bring the different technologies from different locations to see whether they can share the technologies, I think, under Julie Howard's leadership. So are working in supporting the USID's initiative on that. Then impact assessment, you know, how can we really evaluate the impact of Feed of the Future? So again, if we're working in supporting you, then empowerment in agriculture index together with uh, the USID colleagues. Then the, uh, some of the trade issues with um, your, your country missions, IPRI has really pushed the, the Tanzanian government not to use the trade bans to isolate the domestic market, market from international market. So I just recently I met with the president of uh, Tanzania. So he committed not to use export ban anymore. Uh, so their farmers will not suffer from lower prices. Their neighbors will also not suffer from the export bans. Yes, we, face, we still face a lot of challenges. For example, population is, is, is increasing. People are urbanized. Uh, they are changing their diet. And the resources are limited. Now, agriculture related risks to health. This is an emerging issue. Avian influenza, MERS, SARS are coming. These are very much related to intensification of agriculture. Then always climate change. So climate change will need, will need more extreme events, more intense events. Just for your information, the latest IPCC study shows that every decade we will lose one to two percent of major crop yield. Not only the loss, but also volatility. So the yield of volatility will increase over time. We needed to think differently on food and nutrition security issues. Leveraging agriculture for nutrition and health. So agriculture is not going to produce, not just to produce, maximize yields or output. It should lead to better nutrition and health for poor and hungry people. Pro pro promoting sustainable intensification. We know that water is limited, land is limited. We've got to produce more. But in the meantime, don't harm the environment. Reduce the climate uh, climate greenhouse gas emission, enhancing resilience to shocks. So how can we make sure that the growth, the social protection, all this can make sure that our food system is resilient. So now we are debating about the post-2015 agenda. That agenda has, has to be ambitious, precise, and obviously realistic. We should aim to end hunger sustainably by 2025. I think we can do it. Many countries' experience have shown that. I think your commitment, the commitment from the national governments, from the so civil society, from the private sector, if we all work together, we will be able to achieve this goal. So we can and we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fan. Though Feed the Future was President Obama's first development initiative, uh, ending hunger and poverty and undernutrition is neither a Democrat nor a Republican value. It is truly a bipartisan American value and something that we believe in deeply. Uh, it is now my distinct honor to introduce Senator Richard Luger, who is a great friend and supporter. Senator Luger spent 36 years in the United States Senate representing Indiana. 
He has been a longtime advocate of agriculture and food security. As far back as the 1990s, he was calling hearings for the world to focus on these issues. As a former chairman and ranking member, respectively, of the Senate Agriculture and Foreign Relations Committees, Senator Luger combined a unique ex expertise in global agriculture programs to drive focus and bipartisan support on the need to address global hunger and food security and what helped set a foundation for Feed the Future. Senator Luger is now the president of the Luger Center. Please, Senator Luger. Well, it's certainly a great privilege and pleasure to join you this morning, to see so many good friends in this very important forum. I've long admired the work of USAID, and as a senator, I sought to support the agency's mission in every way that I could. And upon leaving the Senate, I wanted to continue my efforts to advance global development. During the last year, I've had the opportunity to build the Luger Center, which is devoted in part to advancing global food security and constructive foreign assistance reform. And we've been so privileged to have Connie Ouellette and Lori Rowley with us uh, in that center. I thank especially Administrator Shaw, a wonderful friend and colleague in all of these endeavors, whose uh, leadership I respect so much. I appreciate the many occasions when we have worked together to support each other's goals. And I'm proud of what USAID is achieving through Feed the Future. I'm confident that progress will continue. And I would also offer a special welcome to representatives of our Feed the Future partners throughout the world. My own interest in food security began 586 miles from here on a 604-acre farm in Indiana. My father, Marvin Luger, bought the farm in the 1930s with the aid of his father, Riley Webster Luger, also a farmer there in Morgan County. I still manage that farm in behalf of our family, which today sits within the city limits of Indianapolis. At the time that I was mayor of Indianapolis, we went into a program called UNIGOV, which brought together the city and the surrounding county with one mayor, one council, all the money on the table at the same time at a very difficult time of civil rights issues in our country. And our farm came into the city at that point. Our planting began this year on May the 3rd. And when all is done, we will have roughly 200 plus acres in corn and 200 plus acres in soybeans this year to go with acreage planted in black walnut trees. Our chances of a bunker crop this year are excellent, given the outstanding array of technologies that our farm and most of American agriculture uses to maximize yield and to protect the environment. Our farm is benefiting from genetically engineered seed, advancements in soil analysis, GPS mapping of land, sophisticated weather forecasting, and numerous other technologies. Last year, we set a record for our farm with a corn yield of 192 bushels to the acre. This is roughly a four-fold increase from the yields we experienced on the same land when I was a boy plucking volunteer corn out of the soybean field. At that time, my dad was pleased when we achieved even 50 bushels to the acre. I relate this personal experience to underscore that agricultural science is capable of delivering miraculous results. Humanity possesses the technology to grow, store, distribute, and market a safe and nutritious supply of food. Having witnessed such an amazing transformation in the span of my lifetime, I've always been optimistic about the world's ability to produce food for nine billion people who are expected to inhabit our Earth by the year 2050. We should look to the future with great hopefulness, 
that we can dramatically reduce the number of people who are hungry. But we are also realistic about the sources of hunger. We know that it usually arises out of circumstances related to poor governance, to conflict, lack of infrastructure and credit, trade barriers, the disadvantages for many women farmers, and many other cultural limitations to productivity. The complexity of the problem demands that we have a plan that emphasizes efficiency and transparency and leverages our relationships with other countries, institutions, and donor groups. We should be focusing intently on what global agriculture should look like 10 to 20 years from now and how we can get there. And even as we advocate strongly for more resources, we should not depend on receiving them. Instead, we must do a better job of applying research and science breaking down trade barriers, facilitating the flow of agricultural knowledge, modernizing global regulatory institutions around scientific advances, and putting more meat on the bone of public-private partnerships. We should put special emphasis on promoting transparency and other means to prevent corruption, which the World Bank has identified as, quote, the single biggest obstacle to economic and social development, end of quote. This requires that agencies and donor institutions, including USAID, embrace transparency measures in the performance of their own functions. We should be forthcoming about where taxpayer dollars are spent, what goals they're meant to accomplish, and whether these goals are achieved. And this is vital not only to provide taxpayers a clear picture of how their money is being used, but also to reinforce U.S. leadership in transparent economic development. Like most of you, I admit to a preoccupation with the problem of global hunger. And as past chairman of both agriculture and foreign relations committees of the United States Senate, a long-standing goal of mine was to develop and pass legislation authorizing a comprehensive program to advance global food security. The culmination of these efforts was the Luger Casey Global Food Security Bill of 2009. Luger Casey, unfortunately, did not become law, but the bill and reports on which it was based helped stimulate debate and establish principles that were important to the foundation of Feed the Future. And I'm pleased with the direction and progress achieved by Feed the Future. And I applaud your emphasis on such core components as women and on smallholder farmers. We must, not, we must not end chronic hunger without ensuring that women and other smallholders have greater access to technology, to credit, extension services, land tenure rights, advanced seeds, and other components that large-scale farmers take for granted. But in the context of domestic politics, further thought must be given to improving congressional support for the program and for global food security efforts in general. The prospects of any unauthorized program become uncertain with the change of administrations. And moreover, we have seen in recent congressional actions how vulnerable initiatives that benefit global food security can be. The recent step, for example, by the House of Representatives to increase the current cargo preference requirement on food from 50% to 75% could prevent timely food assistance from reaching millions of desperate people. It's important that the Senate remove that provision both to preserve the lives at risk and to avoid damage to the United States' leadership on food security. Now, looming over all our hopes for eliminating hunger is the threat of climate change because it has the potential to alter the basic assumptions upon which both global and regional agriculture function. All of us understand the rancor that has developed in the climate change debate. 
The issue exists not just as a scientific and economic controversy, but also as a political and social one. It's beyond the powers of those of us here to construct a political consensus on climate change. But if we care about feeding the world, we need to examine what practical steps should be taken to bolster food production in the context of climate projections. And just as the United States military, for example, has incorporated climate change into its planning, we must do the same. A part of the response, I believe, must be overcoming the resistance to the use of advanced biotechnology in global food production. Biotechnology, including genetically engineered seeds, will be absolutely indispensable over the long run to feeding nine billion people in the conditions of a changing climate. Biotechnology cannot by itself guarantee that the world is fed. But without a broad application of this technology around the world, our ability to expand food production to required levels will be seriously handicapped. The hard work being done through Feed the Future demonstrates the American commitment to global food security. And I believe that our nation's continuing devotion to this goal is an essential component of our status as a moral nation. Moreover, I believe that the United States, with its world-famous land-grant universities, its expert farmers, its successful agribusinesses, its development professionals, will be one of the key determinants of whether our world will be hungry or food secure. I believe we are up to that challenge. And I applaud the commitment that each of you has made to global food security as your presence here testifies. I admire your dedication to the ultimate goal of limiting hunger and malnutrition. I look forward to our achievements in the coming years together. And I wish you the very best as you work to implement the most effective program possible in the world. Thank you so very much. For the people of poor nations, we pledge to work alongside you to make your farms flourish and let clean waters flow, to nourish starved bodies and feed hungry minds. to work alongside you to make your farms flourish and let clean waters flow, to nourish starved bodies and feed hungry minds. We say we can no longer afford indifference to the suffering outside our borders, nor can we consume the world's resources without regard to effect. For the world has changed, and we must change with it. Good morning. It is uh, entirely appropriate that we're, I'm preceded here by uh, President Obama's comments delivered during the, his very first inaugural address, which gives you a sense of his commitment and passion to this issue. Uh, I'm also honored to be able to follow Senator Luger. Uh, when, when the senator uh, retired, a number of us got a chance to be at some of the ceremonies recognizing his service. And one of the messages I took away from that process was that on the list of American political leaders over the last half century, very few are genuinely acclaimed as statesmen by members of both sides of the political spectrum. And Senator Luger absolutely is one of them. I also want to recognize, there's so many wonderful partners in this room to recognize, uh, but I would like to say hello to Peter McPherson, former USAID administrator. Thank you, Peter, for being with us. Uh, 
Schengen fan for his uh, very helpful presentation this morning, laying the groundwork, uh, and my friend Ambassador David Lane, who is here from Rome, recognizing the importance of this issue and the critical nature of Feed the Future and our efforts to bring all of our international partners along in this journey to end hunger and poverty in the next two decades. Uh, a number of colleagues at USAID and on the Feed the Future team have worked very hard to put this forum together. And so I'd like to thank Wendy Corson, Kurt Reinsma, Julie Howard, Jim Barnhart, Caitlin Lesnick, uh, and so many others who have, who have led. And in particular, I'd like to recognize uh, Jonathan Schreier, the Deputy Coordinator for Feed the Future at the State Department, who has made this work his mission for a number of years. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and of course, Jada McKenna, our, our very own, who has a new baby and the responsibility of leading uh, President Obama's signature development initiative. And I'm not sure which one creates more sleep sleepless nights, but thank you, Jada, for your outstanding leadership. Uh, this morning, we have an outstanding collection of friends and partners with us. I see humanitarian development and government leaders from more than 30 countries, advocates from both sides of the aisle, leaders from across U.S. government agencies uh, representing the full force and effort that our country can bring to bear to make this vision a reality, and more than 50 USAID mission directors who have extended their stay from last week's mission director, global mission director conference. And I'd like to just take a moment to remind us, this is uh, Feed the Future in Cambodia, but could I have the next slide, please? Or do I click? Maybe I click. Oh, there we go. I'd like to take a moment to remind us where we started in this endeavor. Uh, it is fitting to start our discussion with President Obama's inaugural address, because that address was delivered immediately following a significant food, fuel, and financial crisis that in fact showed that food security is intricately linked to global security in many, many parts of our world. In fact, for more than 20 years preceding that moment, agricultural funding and focus in research, in science, and in development had been on the decline. Rising fuel prices sent prices for basic staple crops, including wheat and rice, through the roof to all-time highs, casting tens of millions of people back to the brink of extreme poverty and pushing millions of children back into a condition of hunger. Food riots rocked countries like Senegal and Pakistan. 10,000 people took to the streets in Dhaka. Cameroon saw the worst unrest in 15 years. In a panic, countries implemented short-sighted policy responses, export bans that hurt trade, slowed growth, and further compounded the problem. The world was in fact shrouded with pessimism on whether we could end hunger. But the greatest impact wasn't felt in the halls of power, but in the bellies of starving children crying every night with hunger. Without nutritious foods, we soon learned they get stunted and lose on a lifelong basis the potential to grow, learn, and thrive. We saw the consequences of this in the popular press at the time. The Washington Post ran a cover story I will never forget that described the consequences of a hunger crisis in Niger that sent hundreds of young girls into forced marriage far earlier than should be the case in a practice that closely resembled slavery. The New York Times covered the story by describing young children, in this case girls in Haiti, making and eating mud cakes to fill the hunger pains in their bellies. It was in this environment when President Obama took office and brought the G20 together to lead a global coordinated effort to mitigate and put to rest the consequences of the global financial crisis, that he also called on those partners to recognize the consequences on food security and make nearly $22 billion of commitments to fight food insecurity around the world. America's part of that commitment was $3.5 billion. 
and while not every country has fully lived up to its pledge, I'm proud to note that the United States has. In fact, thanks to tremendous bipartisan support, through Feed the Future, we have since committed more than $5 billion to address hunger and extreme poverty. And we will continue to make investments in the years to come. But Feed the Future, as Senator Luger points out, is not simply a commitment of financial resources. It is a new and comprehensive approach. Instead of merely providing food aid in times of crisis, it fundamentally relies on supporting agriculture as a business, especially one that works for women and works for small-scale agricultural producers in largely agrarian economies. Instead of trying to work everywhere at once, we chose partners selectively based on their own commitments to policy reforms and their own willingness to increase their domestic investment in agriculture alongside increased donor funds. In fact, since 2010, we've phased out of agriculture programs in more than 30 countries in order to focus resources on the 19 where we believe we can have the biggest direct impact. In addition, we took on food aid reform, championing a cause that Senator Luger has fought for for a long time to ensure that we're buying more food locally, creating real market incentives for these small-scale farmers. We helped pass a new farm bill that includes important reforms that will allow us to have more flexibility to purchase locally. We can stand here and proudly say that today we will end the practice of monetized food assistance in nearly every country around the world this year as a result of those reforms. And I want to just personally note and recognize that I welcome Senator Luger's important comments on cargo preference legislation that is taking hold in the House and Senate this year. In addition, we invested in resilience using America's decades-long capacity to provide humanitarian response to help build resilience and social protection for the most vulnerable families around the world. All of this has been intended to uh, change the way we perform on food security. And four years after the President made his commitments, I'm proud to join you today to launch the 2014 Feed the Future Progress Report that delivers on the President's commitments. And let me just share with you a few of the top line numbers. Nearly 7 million farmers have been supported and assisted with the application of technologies that pulls, puts them on a path of moving themselves out of extreme poverty. Nearly 12 and a half million children are moving from being hunger, hungry and undernourished to being adequately nourished so they can learn, grow, and thrive. Agriculture is being transformed on 4 million hectares of land a landmass that is twice the size of Massachusetts. And perhaps most importantly, we are leveraging more than $7 billion in private investment from more than 160 companies, including local and international firms for a broad range of Feed the Future countries. What does all of this mean on the ground? It means what you would expect that when President Obama had the chance to visit Senegal a year ago, he was able to meet farmers who are transforming their lives and transforming their communities. The one farmer he met, Nimna, started a woman's farming cooperative in her community with the support of Feed the Future. This is a photo of the president speaking with her. And in the last year, 17,000 Senegalese farmers like her have become small-scale entrepreneurs, benefiting from nearly $20 million in rural loans and grants and helping to expand the reach of agriculture as a business, especially in service of women. Meanwhile, our friends at the Millennium Challenge Corporation are rehabilitating a large-scale irrigation system in the nearby Senegal River Valley Delta. And by working together with infrastructure and agricultural support, we can start to see a real transformation of a breadbasket in that country. 
Senegal is now a member of the new Alliance for Food Security, launched by President Obama at the G8 summit at Camp David, and we're seeing private companies increase their investments. As a result, we see the rate of extreme poverty coming down significantly in country after country, including in Senegal. In Haiti, where children once ate mud cakes, Feed the Future works closely with small-scale farmers to improve productivity despite tough planting seasons, two storms, and a drought. We increased rice yields by 129%, corn by 340%, and beans by 100% in just the last few years. The Nationwide Demographic and Health Survey that was just released in that country shows that there's been significant progress in terms of child nutrition as a result of these efforts. In Ethiopia, we recently partnered with DuPont and local agricultural cooperatives to help 35,000 maize farmers access improved crop varieties. And not by receiving a gift of seed, but by engaging in agriculture as a business, buying improved varieties with their own resources, planting them, earning more, and reaping the benefit from that transformation. All told, in the last year alone, in Ethiopia, we leveraged nearly $70 million of private investment for Ethiopian farmers, most from local companies, to help them grow their businesses. And as a result, 1.7 million children moved from being hungry to being adequately nourished. In, in the last decade, Ethiopia has brought down the rate of extreme poverty by more than 20% and is now on path to envision the end of extreme poverty by 2030. These results have come not just from teaching farmers how to plant or engaging in traditional agricultural development programs, but they have also resulted in a renewed spirit that agriculture is and can be a profitable business at small scale and at large scale in country after country. That's why President Obama announced the new alliance at the G8. It's why we continue to work with the Grow Africa Partnership and why we were really thrilled just last week to note that in Africa, together with African heads of state and private sector partners, the Grow Africa Partnership has now resulted in $970 million of actualized investments on the ground in Grow Africa countries and $7.2 billion of total commitments over the next several years. It's this power of public engagement, private investment, policy reforms, support from international experts and scientists that can actually make a dent at ending hunger in our lifetime. Now, if there's still any doubt that we're on the verge of a new green revolution, The Economist just recently published an article last week describing the transformation underway on small farms around the world. As farmers plant improved seeds that are more resilient to the consequences of climate change, to heat, drought, pests, and disease, we're seeing improved productivity on small farms and large farms across Feed the Future countries. From research labs of the world's most elite universities, including great American land-grant universities, to research partners in the field in Feed the Future countries, these scientific innovations are not just getting developed, but they're actually reaching farm households. USAID and Feed the Future is proud to play a leading role in supporting technology and science to be transformational. We've more than doubled our research investments over the last several years, developing and deploying more than 34 new drought-resistant varieties of maize in the last five years alone. And today, I'm pleased to announce a new $5 million research partnership with Texas A&M, specifically the Borlaug Institute at Texas A&M, dedicated to eliminating coffee rust in Latin America and Central America. This is a disease that over the last few years has caused more than $1 billion of economic damage and threatens how millions of Central Americans earn their living. Today, Farmers face the worst outbreak in Latin American history. And if we don't bring together the power of science and technology to tackle this issue, we know that some of the important gains we've made together 
public and private, in these economies will start to be seen in reverse. To pioneer similar breakthroughs in other areas of work, we've established 23 Feed the Future Innovation Laboratories led by U.S. universities, the bedrock of our nation's agricultural research capacity. Taken together, these investments are lifting families out of extreme poverty and sowing the seeds of productive, profitable agricultural markets that we will need to feed 9 billion people by the year 2050. At the end of the day, progress does not come just from new seeds and great new technologies, as important as they are. They will come from leaders who make the commitment and have the courage to continue to fight for food security, for agricultural development, for extension efforts, and for public-private partnership, tackling this cause over time. That's why I'm so glad that the USAID mission directors are here. I believe, and you see from the photo of our entire team around the world, that our missions need to remain focused on this as a core developmental priority for many, many, many years to come. In fact, it was a prior USAID administrator who coined the term Green Revolution. And while we're not gonna get into naming things today, uh, I believe that, uh, as to all of my USAID colleagues, it is your responsibility to continue to make sure that we embrace the opportunity to lead this initiative, we embrace our interagency partners to make sure we maximize our opportunity to have impact, and we continue to fight for the resources, the policy reforms, and the partner efficiency required to deliver the success we all seek. Now, it's important to note that this is not just a USAID program. This is, in fact, a whole-of-government enterprise. And that's particularly important because it is the USADF and its food security programs that have helped create more than $21 million in new economic activities. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. It's the Peace Corps that has fielded 12,000 Feed the Future volunteers who are helping people irrigate lands and support Feed the Future programs in country after country. USDA has formally launched our government's open agricultural data initiative and, and improved statistical systems in half a dozen Feed the Future countries already. And we're proud to sign a new MOU with USDA to improve coordination between our education programs and the McGovern Dole school feeding program so we can have the biggest possible impact. The MCC has moved forward on compacts from Mozambique to Tanzania, providing significant resources for core underlying road and irrigation infrastructure that we all know is how farmers take crops to market and realize improved incomes. And the Department of State has continued to use its leadership at the highest levels, including on Secretary Kerry's trip just a few weeks ago, to make sure we're securing important policy commitments from country after country because we know these gains will only scale if countries do the right thing and continue to lead. The Treasury Department leads our engagement with international uh, financial institutions and I'm pr proud to note that the Global Agricultural and Food Security Program, the GAFSP, I don't know why we named it that, <laughs> uh, has brought total multilateral funding of nearly $1 billion to small businesses in the agricultural sector in 31 countries. From the Departments of Commerce and Treasury to the U.S. Geological Survey and OPIC, this task requires every single partner to remain committed, not just during this administration, but for future years to come. And that's why we endorse and hope that Senator Luger's call for authorizing legislation will in fact become a reality during this term. Now, lest you get the impression that the United States is leading this fight alone, I think it's important to remind ourselves that we're part of a constellation of actors that starts with leadership in country that has the capacity to make a difference. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I had the chance to be with a group of African heads of state who are the embodiment of this leadership. When Tanzania removed its export ban, Burkina Faso passed two significant laws governing public-private partnership. Ethiopia passed a new law changing the way it opens up its seed sector to private enterprise. 
and Rwanda has strengthened its focus on supporting farmer cooperatives. These are just some of the examples of the practical leadership we will continue to advocate for in country after country because we know that as development practitioners and partners, our efforts only succeed when everyone works well together. Finally, this morning's launch of the Progress Report does not just celebrate the leadership of our partners, as important as that is, or the impact of our investments. It does something, I think, much, much more important. It upholds our commitment to closely monitor, measure, and publicly and transparently report on the progress we make or lack thereof. The report's findings are grounded in a robust management system developed to gather and disseminate real data, accurate data, in a timely manner that describes the impacts on household incomes of our efforts, and importantly, the participation of women and children as beneficiaries of our programs. This month, we're proud to launch the Women's Empowerment Index, Women's Empowerment Agricultural Index Baseline Report, which provides a comprehensive analysis from 13 countries of whether our efforts are helping women in a preferential manner. I encourage you to read this report because it confirms what many of us suspect, which is that while we're making real progress, on average, women are twice as disempowered as men, which means men are much more likely to be the beneficiaries of agricultural development programs, even though we try to focus on women, and even though women provide in these economies more than 70% of total farm labor all in. Just as the demographic and health survey helped create a statistical and data baseline that guided global health efforts and investments over many decades, I believe the Feed the Future monitoring system has the potential to be just as transformational. And that's why when, can I have the last slide? Thank you. That's why when a few months ago, when President Obama was in Rome and he arrived at the Vatican, he presented Pope Francis with a small chest filled with fruit and vegetable seeds from the White House garden. It was a poignant gift, one symbolizing the president's own commitment to this deeply moral mission. Now, while these are not the exact seeds we're going to be distributing around the world, <laughs> and you all know why, it is an important expression of the fact that uh, we need to stay committed, that this mission to help now 827 million people no longer go hungry is an achievable one. That this mission is deeply in America's national security interest. That this mission is critical to our ability to build and engage with a more prosperous world. But that this mission also carries with it a greater moral calling and a greater moral significance. So thank you for being here. I hope over the next uh, days you will share your ideas and your thoughts on how we can do better. You will push us to think differently about some of the things we're committed to. You will spend some time on Capitol Hill so you can see and continue to build the strong bipartisan commitment that exists in support of Feed the Future. And you will uh, focus on some of the new announcements we're going to make this week that will expand our ability to bring science and innovation to children in an effort to reduce malnutrition in a more measurable and significant manner. So thank you for being here, and I wish you luck with an important week for Feed the Future. When President Obama entered office, he mobilized global leaders behind a common vision to end hunger and extreme poverty by boosting agricultural productivity. Since then, the United States has stood with small-scale farmers around the world to achieve this vision through Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiative. In just a few short years, Feed the Future is demonstrating progress to significantly reduce both poverty and stunting where it works. And the world is striving to meet the Millennium Development Goal to cut hunger and malnutrition in half by 2015. So the question is no longer if we will end hunger for the more than 800 million people who don't have enough to eat today, but when. 
we urgently need to accelerate this global momentum. Our when is now. Feed the Future is mobilizing partners and harnessing science and technology so farmers and producers can access the tools they need to grow and sell more nutritious foods. We're working with researchers around the world to increase access to new technologies. And when droughts or floods occur, or when disasters strike, make sure people have the ability to endure. We're working with local leaders to ensure women have rights to the land they tend and can lift their families out of poverty. We're working with developing country governments to help shape policy to connect local farmers with global markets. We're working with local and international companies to make responsible investments in agriculture. In Honduras, farmers are increasing their incomes through coffee and horticulture crops. In Senegal, finance institutions are offering farmers crop insurance, making them more resilient to crop losses and natural disasters. In Bangladesh, rice farmers improved fertilizers, boosted crop yields, and ultimately increased sales from $33 million to $57 million. Just last year, Feed the Future helped nearly 7 million farmers and food producers improve their productivity and yields on more than 4 million hectares of land and reached more than 12.5 million children through nutrition interventions. Feed the Future is demonstrating clear results which, taken to scale, can be truly transformative. But Feed the Future is not just a story about farmers, scientists, civil society, and private companies. It's also about you. You can be a champion of our new approach. Together, we can turn inputs into outcomes against hunger, poverty, and poor nutrition. The time to accelerate momentum toward a vision of a hunger-free world is now. Let's do what was once thought impossible. Let's stop fighting hunger. Let's end it for good. Like, follow, feed. Great. So as we've said before, Feed the Future was the first development initiative of, of this administration. Um, and so it really challenged us uh, to not only achieve our targets, but also to do so in a way that would herald new and different ways that we were practicing development. So operationalizing Feed the Future as a new model for development, um, we, were led, we were told to be country-led, to focus and concentrate, to work in deep partnerships with others. And as some of our mission directors will say, that came with a lot of successes, but it also came with a lot of reporting back to Washington <laughs> and some other things. So we thought this panel would be great to talk to the different agencies and different USA counterparts about what it was to operationalize Feed the Future, how, what that meant in terms of doing business differently and what we've learned from that, as, as well as some of the challenges. On the stage joining me in this conversation, um, to my left we have Jonathan Schreier, uh, the Special Representative for Global Food Security in the State Department's Office of Global Food Security, as well as the Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future. Ross Kramer, the Acting Deputy Administrator of the Office of Foreign Service Operations at the Foreign Agricultural Services at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mr. Dennis Wellard, our Mission Director in USAID Ethiopia. Cameron Kahn, the Vice President of the Department of Compact Operations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Cheryl Anderson, our Mission Director, USAID South Africa. And Ms. Dina Esposito, the Director of the Office of Food for Peace in our Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. Jonathan, when Feed the Future was set up, it had a unique leadership structure of two deputy coordinators, one for development at USAID and one for state, one at, for state for diplomacy. Um, can you talk to us a little bit how state has embraced the diplomacy role of Feed the Future and how your office has contributed to Feed the Future? Sure. Thanks, Jada. And, and thank you for your leadership. And Administrator Shaw, thank you for your leadership of this initiative. Um, it really is a, a part of a new way of doing business that we've thrown away some of the old models. One of the old-fashioned views of the relationship between diplomacy and development was that diplomacy it was that development work 
was used as a tool of diplomacy. So we had an objective of, of, of shoring up our, our international allies and, and maybe steering uh, assistance uh, towards them preferentially. That's not the way things are working in Feed the Future. Feed the Future is about solving problems and about using the tools of diplomacy to support attainment of our development objectives. And, and uh, in this effort, we've seen it right from the beginning. There was the effort that uh, Administrator Shah mentioned uh, by President Obama to mobilize the international community around, the, uh, around meeting the hunger and malnutrition challenge. And that took a lot of diplomatic effort to line up the, the uh, L'Aquila Food Security Initiative and the subsequent adoption by the international community of the Rome Principles, which defined the new way of doing business in, in uh, uh, the fight against hunger and undernutrition, uh, the, the principles that underlie Feed the Future. We also uh, um, have worked through my office uh, um, to, uh, to organize events on the margins of the UN General Assembly, high-level meetings each year, uh, to spotlight the, the new approaches that Feed the Future represents. And so in 2010, uh, we spotlighted the challenge of nutrition, launched the 1,000 Days Partnership in support of the UN Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. Uh, in 2011, we organized a, an event on the role of women in agricultural development, bringing together presidents and uh, leaders of civil society and private sector uh, representatives to spotlight that issue. In 2012, we organized an event on the role of civil society as a, an essential partner in solving the hunger and undernutrition challenge. And it was at that event that uh, our partners in interaction, the US-based NGO community, announced a major commitment of funding for the, the fight against hunger and undernutrition. We continue to work um, at this, these intersections with our, our global priorities. Uh, um, now we, we are uh, working, as President Obama and Secretary Kerry have announced in, in recent months, uh, to support a successful U.S. presence at the Milan Expo 2015, where the Italian government has spotlighted food security and food as the, the theme for that event. And so we're working to make sure that our, our work in Feed the Future and across the U.S. government is effectively highlighted there. We're also working at, at other new, uh, on other new cross-cutting challenges that are emerging in this space. Uh, Dr. Fahn mentioned uh, um, climate change as a key challenge, a key constraint on our ability to, uh, to, to solve hunger and undernutrition in our lifetimes. Um, so uh, we've been working together with USDA, with USAID, with the Department of Treasury to uh, help to launch a, uh, later this year a new global level alliance for climate smart agriculture. And uh, through this effort, through diplomacy, we've uh, already um, uh, heard words of support for that effort from the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, and so we are hoping to see that, that alliance launched at the UN Secretary General's Climate Change Summit this, this September. So these are some of the many ways that we put the tools of diplomacy behind ach achievement of our development objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Ross. USDA has been an important partner in the Feed the Future initiative from our work uh, co-designing the Feed the Future research strategy through implementation of your food assistance program, uh, but also by leveraging your expertise in agricultural statistics to build capacity in our focus countries. Um, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration and, and how this kind of whole of government approach has expanded into other sectors for USDA? Uh, thank you, Jada. In fact, uh, the whole of government approach uh, is a deceptively simple process. Nothing easy about it at all. And in fact, uh, I think that we're up here today to discuss how we collaborate and how across agency, across department, is a testament to truly seeking interagency. Uh, one of the things that the Department of Agriculture did uh, after uh, President Obama stood up to feed the future was to set up his own internal to USDA Global Food Security Council. Now that's within the Department of Agriculture. There are many silos there, but the secretary uh, stood up a committee of six of these uh, mission areas within the department. Uh, he chairs that council, along with the deputy undersecretaries of each of, of those program areas, and it's uh, also the executive director of that is one of my bosses in the Foreign Agricultural Service, Suzanne Palmieri. The important thing here is that uh, USDA, of course, brings to bear uh, the breadth 
and the depth of research, not only in the land grant institutions that uh, Senator Luger mentioned, but also in developing the economies, uh, the rural economies across America and in helping with agricultural business development. So th these uh, meetings are then uh, spun out into operational teams across USDA to tackle specific questions that might arise at the larger level of the, the Feed the Future. Uh, we, uh, as you may already know, are in five countries and two regions around the world. Uh, those regions are West Africa and Central America. Uh, most of our work in USDA is in value chain improvement and in market-driven uh, institutions, also uh, science-based policies. All of these, uh, Dr. Shaw has mentioned too, uh, as well as the Senator. And you'll no doubt hear more about this on Wednesday when Secretary Vilsack uh, comes along. Uh, Dr. Shaw has also mentioned the open data system, and you'll no doubt hear more about that Wednesday from our Undersecretary, Dr. Wotecki. Uh, we are working to align uh, our McGovern Dole program, which uh, Administrator Shaw has mentioned. Uh, that uh, offers a, a rare opportunity in government to leverage uh, two uh, uh, strong initiatives that will no doubt have a, a great impact, especially on young women around the world. Uh, let me also mention that USDA, which uh, has 100 uh, attaches, 320 locally engaged staff around the world, also works with the U.S. private sector uh, and the U.S. agriculture business and our USDA cooperators, a family, if you will. Uh, I'd like to just end with uh, my own personal experience in Feed the Future, taking it away from Washington at the high level and going to Mozambique when I was our uh, regional director of agriculture in Pretoria, I had the opportunity to work with the development, the, the standing up, if you will, of the Mozambique uh, country strategy. And that was a robust uh, cross-agency effort, I'm pleased to say, from the ambassador to the, the head of mission, Todd Amani, and his agricultural office. We were able to realign the programming that USDA brings to bear in many markets uh, to nest within the Feed the Future uh, basket that helped to support uh, the local uh, strategy and has made the whole U.S. government approach there truly cross-agency. Thank you. Dennis um, and Ross started us down this path as well. Um, the coordination at the central level is important and it's great, but as we all know, results um, and action happen at the country level where, where small farmers live and reside. Um, I like to call Ethiopia one of our great Feed the Future laboratories because almost every single aspect of the program is really in Ethiopia and, and, and thriving there. Could you talk to us about how this initiative comes to life in Ethiopia and, and it's particularly how you've worked in partnership uh, with so many organizations in Ethiopia to achieve the results that you have? Thanks, Jade. I, I, I think what we've done is just building on rock what Ross is saying, kind of at the field level, uh, this whole government approach, we've, we've, we're also a, a new alliance uh, for, for food security and, and nutrition country. So there's a, a, a fairly robust set of policies out there that, that, that we're working with, with the government on to, to advance some of these policies around land, around feed, uh, around basically kind of getting credit out to farmers that's so much needed to actually to get, get with some of these technologies actually to, to, to scale. So our ambassador really leads this effort in, in working with the government, with, 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 with others out there to get these, and, and other ambassadors, particularly G8 ambassadors, to really get these G8 policy, uh, these policies out there and, and delivered. Just a couple weeks ago, uh, Elizabeth Littlefield, the head of OPEC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, was in, in Ethiopia, and, and, and she and, uh, and I met with a, a group of about 30 or 40 businessmen and women uh, to talk about how OPEC's kind of facility could, of, of mobilizing capital could actually uh, unleash some of the, 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 the financial uh, 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 needs uh, that, that would actually go towards uh, some of these investments that's so, so much needed. Um, Peace Corps, another uh, aid, uh, or organization we work very closely with, just swore in, I think last week, about 30, 60 volunteers, half of those 
we're Feed the Future volunteers. And that makes, I, I think this new crop of volunteers makes Ethiopia the largest Peace Corps program in, in, in the world. And, um, we just this, this past week, we've had a delegation here from, from, from Ethiopia, high level delegation from both public sector as well as the private sector, looking at uh, and, and meeting a lot, and, and USDA has helped us a lot here. We work across the border with USDA in so many ways, but they really helped link this team up with the, uh, with the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, the, the Dairy Association, uh, US, uh, American Dairy Association, the Farm Bureau, to really bring investment to the livestock industry in, in Ethiopia. And livestock is such an important value chain that we have there that, that not only is, is, is will reduce poverty and increase incomes, but actually really improves the resilience, as, as Dr. Shaw, you talked about earlier, when that drought comes and, and having kind of a, a, a more vibrant livestock sector, and we've got the largest livestock herd in all of Africa there in Ethiopia, it's going to really help unlock a lot of the, uh, it help, help a lot of these pastoralists who would have otherwise kind of sunk back into destitution become much more resilient. I think, let me just end a, bit, a little bit by talking about why these kind of, this whole government approach has worked so well, and a lot of it's because of the kind of leadership we see in Ethiopia that's allowed so many of these partnerships to, to be effective. And one of the really effective partnerships we had was the, uh, the Agriculture Transformation Agency. It's, a, it's an agency that's kind of a quasi-government quasi, uh, organization that reports directly to the Prime Minister. But they've been so effective at taking these good ideas, this research, technology, scaling them up, getting them out to farmers, test uh, a local grain that's, so, that's a staple food for so many, so many of, the, of the Ethiopians, Planting that in rows rather than just broadcasting it the way they've been doing it traditionally has we've seen get production up almost double on some of that. We've seen ATA working in, uh, with, with, with the DuPont Pioneer on getting maize seed, uh, better quality maize seed out to farmers. And as a, a farmer from Illinois, I, I really understand the importance and the power of, of hybrid seed and what that can do to, to, to a farming population. Uh, and we're scaling this up from 30,000 or so maybe to 100, 200,000 because we see that the real impact of this. And, and, and finally, just working with local organizations as well, uh, 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 a local organization called Gus Agwin that's taking a, a fairly important crop that we have in Ethiopia, one of our value chains, chickpeas, kind of garbanzo beans, and working with PepsiCo and this public-private partnership to, to, to develop this into a, uh, a very nutrition, nutritional product, uh, a ready-to-use uh, nutritional product that's so, so important, I think, to to lifting the nutrition of so many of the uh, uh, population that, that needs this sort of product. So these sorts of partnerships, this sort of overall kind of whole of government approach uh, has been so effective in us, I think, seeing the, the progress and the delivering results that, uh, that we've talked about earlier today. Thank you very much. Cameron, in addition to partnerships, the Feed the Future approach really emphasizes and embraces working with countries that have demonstrated their own commitment um, to embracing food security. Um, another great gift of the Millennium MCC to the initiative has really been our strong focus on measuring the impact of our efforts through a strong monitoring and evaluation system. And, and, and in the early days, we leaned heavily on MCC for expertise in that to help us lead the way. Um, you've given us a strong model on these concepts for Feed the Future. Can you talk about how MCC addresses food security as part of the Feed the Future and how we've built on the lessons learned and some of your investments on that journey? Great, thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting us, and I think I want to also thank uh, the administrator and AIB in general for truly keeping this a whole of government initiative. Uh, I think the efforts that you have taken, I know they're not easy, they don't always work, but they're very critical to make sure that not only do we stay together now, but going forward, this remains a whole of government uh, initiative. Um, MCC and Food the Future certainly do share some DNA, uh, particularly when it comes to country ownership uh, and a business-like approach to dealing with this challenge. As the administrator men mentioned, we are making progress in this area around the world, not because we are more sincere now than we were before, but I think because we are smarter now, more focused, more business-like, in our delivery, in our engagement than we perhaps were in the past. And we need to keep that momentum uh, going forward. MCC, as you all know, is a very uh, small agency, has only been around for about 10 years. 
uh, but we're very selective in the countries we work in based on the performance that they have demonstrated on key values that are important to America and are necessary for development. We also invest after doing a very thorough analytical analysis of the project, so we look at economic rate of returns and all our investment. Based on that, uh, food security uh, has been a key part of our investment. Over the last 10 years, we have invested roughly about $4.6 billion in food security uh, area. Out of that, I would say roughly about $3 billion has been on critical infrastructure, rural roads, uh, storage facilities, things that are critical to increasing productivity in the agricultural sector. Almost a billion dollars in irrigation, which is a key, we almost think of it as an insurance policy. A lot of crops that are based on rain only, uh, you change the dynamic immediately once you provide irrigation facilities. We also invest a lot in capacity building, training of farmers, um, as well as policy reform to make sure that the policies are, are correct. We've also experimented with rural finance, very difficult area to, to succeed in, but we have experimented. So we, roughly about $4.6 billion. We work very closely with the IG and, and Food the Future. Uh, you heard the administrator talking about Senegal where we have invested in irrigation and Feed the Future has dealt with all the post-harvest uh, infrastructure. We have similar examples in Moldova and other countries. Uh, Tanzania, where we built the trunk road, which is very expensive, almost 460 kilometers of trunk road. And then Feed the Future is able to come in and provide the rural roads that connect to it. Very good combination that requires upfront planning and strategic understanding between the agencies. And we're trying now systematically to do this with all our new compacts. So this is not a, you got lucky because you had the right people in the two agencies, but that it's an institutional uh, commitment that is taken care of at the design stage. But what I'm most excited about is a new uh, type of uh, partnership. And this one, I'll give you an example. This comes out of our work in Indonesia, where we are addressing head on the issue of stunting. We have a $130 million commitment just for this issue. And we're working with the government of Indonesia as part of their community driven, uh, driven development program. In, in, in those of you who know Indonesia, they, it's called PNP Generasi. And we're basically expanding the government program. And in that we're addressing things like mother's health, we're addressing things like um, you know, fortification of foods and so on. But at the end of the day, you do have to address the problem of how do we get micro, micronutrients to the hinterlands, to the villages. And there we have now identified that as one of the areas where we will try to work with the AIG um, Innovation Lab mm -hmm. to see if we can bring a private sector angle into delivery of micronutrients. Look, we've tried to do it through the government process. We can try to do it better, but it's clearly not delivering the results. So why not try something new? So this is the future of how I hope we would be working across some of these ideas, not about just more effort, but smarter effort and more business-like effort. And last but not least, our um, evaluation, commitment to evaluation remains. AI, you know, AIB as well as MCC, we feel very strongly that without doing an evaluation of what we have done, we shouldn't do more investment. So we, we take that to heart. We've already done evaluations of our programs on farmer training, and we now have organized agriculture and land as a global practice within MCC, which is responsible for doing these evaluations. So you'll be seeing a lot of uh, new impact evaluations coming out in areas of land and cadaster work, which we do on um, uh, agriculture credit, things like that, which we will be able to share and make sure that not only are we learning, but that other partner agencies are able to learn as well. Great, thank you. Um, Cheryl, I'll, I'm gonna wanna turn to you next. So I mentioned Cheryl uh, Anderson is the mission director in USAID South Africa, but 
Um, Cheryl was also the mission director in Ghana when we were launching Feed the Future. And in the early days, we got criticized for talking about process a lot. But the process of launching was tough, <laughs> um, particularly because in some countries, uh, we were part of the strategy meant kind of changing their existing programming entirely, moving to new regions of the country, working in different value chains than they'd been working at. Um, and so, Cheryl, if, if you could talk to this experience of kind of reorienting um, a program and, and also just your, your perspective from Ghana as well as uh, anything you want to share from South Africa, which is one of a, a strategic partner of Feed the Future. Uh, we look to work in South Africa uh, to work on developing food security in the region more broadly. So, Cheryl, you want to start? Okay, thank you. I'll start with the strategic and geographic focus and then I'll also talk a little bit about leveraging new partners and different kinds of partnerships. Having a strong strategic and geographic focus was something that was really important in Feed the Future and to us in Ghana so that we could have an intensive effort where we would be able to achieve significant and measurable results. And that's much easier said than done. Uh, especially when you have an existing program like we had that was rather broad for a lot of good reasons with a lot of key players. Uh, but we decided that we would focus on the north of Ghana. That was the Ghana government's priority, the most impoverished part of the country. And we had to have a value chain approach. But we decided that we would focus on a very limited number of value chains and condense that number from a large number of value chains we had intended to, to support. Because that was where we could have the biggest impact on poverty and on hunger. Very, very tough decisions. It meant uh, shifting programs. It meant uh, not being in the areas where we were already set out to have activities. But as a result, of this focus, we are really in the position now of achieving measurable and significant results. For example, after two seasons, the farmers in our focus areas, I am now told, uh, are, are doubling their yields, in some cases tripling their yields, as well as their income. And I have to say, in this effort, we couldn't have done it without a lot of commitment from our team, our Ghana government uh, players, and ACDI VOCA as a very, very strong partner. And I'm glad that you're going to be able to hear from uh, some of those people uh, in, the, in the later parts of the conference. Uh, talking about partners, we really worked hard to leverage uh, other partners towards Ghana's food security initiatives. And uh, we, we really zeroed in on the World Bank as a critical partner, the biggest player in agriculture with the government in Ghana. And we had been doing some planning with them. We had been doing some uh, joint uh, assessments. But we decided, let's really do it. Let's really align our efforts in one program on commercial agriculture. We had the same objectives with the World Bank and with the Ghana government. Not just work together, but really show that we can, we can be in one project together. Also easier said than done. Uh, there were moments when I was ready to pull the plug on this whole thing. Um, and you're smiling, a lot of you, because you're in it. Yes. Um, lots of, you've got two, you've got really three organizations with major, major um, rules that have developed over time that are hard to change, but um, and cumbersome systems. But I'm really glad to say that we now have one program that really has the potential now to transform commercial agriculture in Ghana. And it is also a model that we can use for other countries because we really are aligned and we're working together. Um, I want to um, just mention a little bit about uh, South Africa because it's a very different model. Um, we are working with strategic partnerships and leveraging all of the, the private capital and the expertise 
and the brilliance that exists in South Africa towards uh, food security objectives in Southern Africa and the rest of the continent. And it's really quite exciting. I have to thank Jonathan Schreier for his really strong leadership on that. Um, but still, the emphasis on, on focusing, focusing, strategic focus is really important. Um, and I would just like to wrap up by saying that um, in addition to the, the areas that I mentioned, uh, focusing and leveraging new partners, in, in Ghana we really had a model that looked at country ownership as primary in all of our decisions, focusing on local solutions, building local capacity, and also harnessing the power of science and technology in ways that we could really scale towards food security. All of which I think is a really good model for um, uh, USAID's new model of development. And I think it's something that we uh, find relevant for all of our work in development. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl, for your candor. Um, the, the, the goal really is part of we, the reason we wanted to bring everyone together is because these things are tough. Otherwise, these problems would have been solved. We would have been working this way a long time ago. So we really do want to get to that honest conversation about how we've gotten through the tough stuff and what we've learned. So thank you. Nina from Food for Peace. Before there was Feed the Future, long before there was Feed the Future, there was Food for Peace, working in deep partnership with many of the people and organizations in this room. And Feed Food for Peace really was the major supporter of agricultural activities um, in USAID when, when other parts of USAID did not have funding to do agriculture. And I, I know we've really tried to build on that as, as we've built the program in, in USAID, um, just like we try to build on MCC's work in, uh, in agriculture uh, and, and USDA's. Um, Dina, can you talk a little bit about ha the collaboration that's happened between Food for Peace and Feed the Future um, and how, how there also has been confusion sometimes about what's Title II, what's FTF, where do we go? So can you talk a little bit about that as well? Thanks, Jada, and thanks for having me. There are major changes underway uh, with regard to how USAID delivers food assistance, and in large part that is due to the Feed the Future initiative. So I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you a little bit about those changes. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Food for Peace sits in the humanitarian side of the AID house in the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. And while 80% of our resources goes to uh, hungry people in times of emergency, be they conflict or natural disasters, 20% of our resources go to long-term five-year development programs where we're targeting the poorest of the poor, the most hungry communities, many of who would otherwise probably be on humanitarian aid. Uh, and our goal is to uh, both provide them with a food transfer and then embark on development interventions that combat stunting and produce ag uh, growth and off-farm incomes for very poor people. Administrator Saad mentioned monetization. Food for Peace by law under the Farm Bill sold food overseas to generate cash in order to give our partners cash to do the development interventions that I've just mentioned. In fiscal year 2012, Food for Peace lost $31 million in the process of monetizing food aid. That is the amount of money that we uh, received when we sold the food aid overseas was $31 million less than it, what it took us to buy it, ship it, and sell it. And so we embarked under the Feed the Future frame to promote a much more efficient form of food assistance. And we did that in two ways. First, we applied some of the Feed the Future monies, uh, community development funds, to end monetization in priority countries. We then took our agenda to the Hill, and in the context of the Farm Bill, we made a strong case to say that if Congress would give us more cash, rather than just food, we could more efficiently deliver results. And Congress heard us. In the new Farm Bill, we have $100 million in additional cash flexibility, and combining that cash flexibility with the CDF funds that we receive under Feed the Future, we will be able to end monetization globally in all but one country. So we were in monetizing in more than a dozen, and now we're monitoring in just, in just one. Um, in addition, Congress gave us some resources that allow us to use Title II monies, the Farm Bill monies, to buy food locally and regionally, and to provide cash transfers or food vouchers to hungry people 
where markets are functioning. This is a major shift for us. And while $100 million doesn't take us very far, it is a down payment in a process that we're going to continue uh, in fiscal year 15. The President's budget asks for $350 million, 25% of the Title II account, to be given to AIG in the form of cash that we can use to buy locally or regionally or for cash transfers and food vouchers. So a major milestone and a significant shift in the way we do food assistance. Um, I also just wanted to note that increasingly um, the collaboration with Feed the Future is leading to combined and shared analysis between the Office of Food for Peace and the Bureau of Food Security staff and missions to come up with um, mutually reinforcing and complementary programming approaches. So for example, in Haiti, we have a new development program. We're providing specialized food products to combat malnutrition under Title II. In a single grant mechanism, we're combining that with community development funds of the Bureau for Food Security, which is helping the government of Haiti initiate a government-led social safety net program that will target the very women receiving our specialized food products to link them to social services and also to provide them with a food voucher, which will enable them to go to the market to buy locally grown foods, the very foods that the Feed the Future value chains are promoting in that. So that's just, I think, really a remarkable example of this new integration of food aid and, and the Feed the Future resources. And I could go on and on. We could talk about uh, Uganda. I could talk about Ethiopia. I could talk about Nepal. Many places where you're seeing this gradual shift and this closer integration between food aid and food assistance on the development side. The resilience agenda of, of the agency, the resilience policy, has further driven home this collaboration where we see uh, Bureau for Food Security, Feed the Future funds joining the emergency accounts in some of these really tough spots where we're trying to combine development and relief resources in order to reduce humanitarian caseloads. You see that in the Sahel and you see that in, in, uh, in Kenya. Finally, I just wanted to note that over the last three years, we have transformed the Title II in-kind food aid basket by studying the uh, nutrition science and trying to better understand what works for vulnerable uh, households. And we have uh, reformulated the micronutrient uh, reformulations for all of our milled and blended foods. And we have brought online two new products to address severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition with another product coming out soon. Uh, and collectively, we are now providing 10% of WFP's requirements for ready-to-use supplementary foods, 10% of UNICEF's global requirements. Again, a major change and a major new refocus and targeting of food assistance to address uh, better address nutritional needs of vulnerable groups. So I will close with that. Thank you, Gina. Food for Peace has been very busy. <laughs> Um, and, and thank you to the rest of our panelists. We've actu we've actu we want to open up the floor now for questions. Um, we, uh, and I'd also like to invite Administrator Shaw to come back um, to help us field some of those questions from a USAID perspective. Um, we will have people with microphones uh, walking, so please just raise your hand if there are any questions. Jim Beaver, USAID Ghana. Cheryl, good to see you up there. Um, Jonathan, good to see you again. I'm, I'm uh, just get as we're in this meeting, I'm getting emails from my mission that uh, there are protests in the northern part of Ghana um, protesting USAID and other initiatives to introduce um, improved hybrid seeds, mischaracterizing them as genetically modified organisms, GMOs even though we've tried to educate uh, proactively um, the public. And I wondered if, not right now, but maybe later in this conference, there might be a small working group of others in the room who've had experience in other countries dealing with this issue so that we can educate the media better, educate the interest groups better. In this case, this one seems, we're not sure, but appears might be 
instigated by the British NGO, International PVO Action Aid, um, seems to be behind the, uh, the protest efforts from press reports. Um, and some of it may be coming from domestic seed producers who don't want the competition from, uh, for example, DuPont Pioneer Seeds that we have a partnership with um, now that's already gotten started in Ghana. So I wonder if anyone had any comments to add from the panel or if otherwise we could have a small working group of people who've had experience dealing with this. I first was introduced to this issue in India 15 years ago and I thought we'd sort of put the stake, wooden stake through the heart of this particular beast, but apparently not. Thank you. Would anyone like to address that or start with it? I'm happy to start with that or, or if you may also want to comment. Um, so so uh, the, the issue that we face is, is how to make agriculture more productive um, in order to feed the over 800 million people that are hungry today and the additional 2 billion people that'll join us by mid-century. Um, and any, any tools that we, we can use to, to uh, make progress faster, we should be using, as long as we can use them safely and, and soundly. And uh, so genetic engineering is certainly one of those tools. It's by no means not the, o it's not the only tool, of course. And as, as you point out, uh, um, the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the plants that we promote through Feed the Future are conventionally bred hybrids. We also do work that uh, um, uh, work through uh, genetic, genetic engineering. Um, countries have a choice whether they want to adopt genetically engineered crops uh, into their into their agricultural systems. And uh, um, w when that choice is made, we're ready to help with uh, advisory services um, uh, through USDA. Um, we also have programs through the U.S. Department of State and and USAID to help support those, those efforts to adopt sound biosafety regimes in order to use genetically engineered crops when, when a country makes that choice. But there are other countries that have not made that choice uh, or, or made the choice in the other direction of opt not to take advantage of genetic engineering. And, uh, and that's, that, that is um, a, 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 you know, a, a national prerogative. Um, and we work with those countries just as uh, enthusiastically as uh, with countries that have adopted GMO into their, into their agricultural systems. Um, so the, the, it, then there's the question of uh, whether the information out there is accurate about genetic, genetically modified organisms. And there, there's also a lot of U.S. government work, um, which we can uh, also hear is being uh, used to full advantage in, in Ghana um, to, uh, to, to uh, beat back myths and, and put out accurate information about uh, genetically modified organisms, which are obviously a, a big part of our food system here in the United States uh, um, uh, without any evidence of, uh, of ill effects. Um, so uh, it, it really is a two-part uh, solution, but uh, uh, I want to turn it over I to Ross. Well, it, it is important to note, too, that Jim's question, uh, I, I do want to note that Jim's question is, that th this is not a question of, of genetically modified seeds. This is about basic hybrid seeds that are being introduced in the north and controversy over that. So I, I agree that people have the fears based on um, others, but basically where Feed the Future and our food production goals meet hard-nosed local politics and competition and uh, scientific fact versus scientific fiction mm -hmm. and how together we can keep moving with the academic scientific community, the producers of seeds and, and the government and other interested groups to, to deal with facts and not politically manipulated fiction and twistings of things so we can be effective. That's kind of what I'm curious what other experiences. Right. And again, we've got a multi-agency set of tools at your disposal to help with that. But Ross is going to tell us more. That uh, Jim, one way to look at this would be that if the local seed manufacturing, seed producers, industry is to the point where they perceive competition from the Feed the Future initiative in northern Ghana, then, then that uh, local seed industry has come a long way. Uh, let, let, let me actually just uh, say one thing to kind of wrap up on this point, which is uh, data, and I see David uh, Beckman, 
Bruce McNamer and others led an effort on Feed the Future to improve civil society consultation. And uh, I hope, Jada, that that will be discussed Indeed. as part of the next few days. Yes. Uh, but they've done a lot of work on this issue. And the bottom line is, we believe it's essential to engage deeply with local civil society as part of Feed the Future. And they've put crafted tools and mechanisms, uh, some with partners like Agra and others that will allow us to do that. Uh, and so I wanna make sure that we highlight the importance of that and, and offer to all of our folks here some of the insights on how to get that done. Yes, and, and I should note also from a process point of view, on Wednesday we will be having open, we're, we're asking people for topics for open lunch discuss, discussion topics so that people can congregate and talk about various things. And civil society engagement is something that we will be talking about a lot as the conference moves on. Um, I see Janina with a microphone. I yeah, I just wanted to um, speak a little bit to the question that Jim was raising. I mean, we have had some controversy in Bangladesh because we're working <laughs> with biotech crops. We're doing that very much in partnership with uh, local research councils, research institutes, and uh, the Bangladeshi Ministry of Agriculture. We have introduced uh, biotech eggplant. Eggplant is a major part of the Bangladeshi um, you know, diet. And we're also working on uh, various varieties of potatoes and other crops. Um, what we found is most effective in terms of dealing with the public controversy aspect is that we let our local partners speak. And they are the ones that are the most effective advocates on, on, this, on the topic. So we have like the Bangladesh uh, Agricultural Research Council and the Agricultural Research Institutes speaking to the science. Uh, when we are asked, like, like when I personally am asked at press conferences about the topic, I I'm always make two points. One is that every country, Bangladesh included, have to choose for themselves. It is uh, their choice whether they want, they feel comfortable with these crops and they want to use them. Second, that we encourage people to uh, focus on science. You know, that there's a lot of myths coming around, but focus on the science. The science seems to indicate that these things are safe and we encourage them to look at the scientific facts. And that's, and we limit our message to those things, that we're offering them choices, offering them opportunities, offering them things to think about. Um, and, in, and we believe that from the science that these are safe, but that it is their choice. Then we let the um, local people, the local scientists, and the local officials from the Ministry of Agriculture carry the dialogue further. And we found that to be pretty effective in, um, in allaying any concerns that people have and, uh, and feeling comfortable. Very quick reaction on that, which is uh, there's also the example that uh, two of our key strategic partners under Feed the Future, South Africa and Brazil, are, 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 are very prominent examples of countries that have adopted genetic uh, genetic engineering in their in their agricultural systems, and they've become enormously successful as producers and exporters of crops. And so, countries that are thinking about this choice might usefully look at those examples. Actually, I was I rose. Rose my hand before the lady spoke a moment ago because I think that she made really two excellent points. Can Long you introduce term. yourself? I know uh, almost everyone knows you, so just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. Can you please introduce yourself? Uh, Peter McPherson. <laughs> Stop. I think that point just made is, is an excellent one, and I believe that we need to, as a donor community, build the scientific capacity locally. As we drive the food production numbers <coughs> and make many other necessary assistance and changes in the years ahead, it, there's gonna be lots of technological change. And the capacity of local people, local institutions, to make judgments about those is just central. I mean, it's really ironical that many of the people supporting climate change which I think is soundly based, uh, don't apply science to, to GMOs. But there's gonna be lots of issues like this. So it, the, we need the equivalent of National Academies of Sciences or strong technological science capacity in the Ministry of Agriculture around the world. And I, I know we're working at that, but that's a, that's a multiple donor effort and a long-term effort. It's really a human, resource, human resource issue. 
where are the microphones? It is, oh, go, please. Sure. <laughs> yes, uh, one of the interesting ways Can you please in introduce which, yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry uh, Dennis Garrity, uh, UNCCD Drylands Ambassador and uh, former Director General of the World Agroforestry Center. And one of the very interesting ways in which this problem of um, acceptance of hybrids and, and modern science technology uh, might be approached, and I want to see if anyone on the panel might like to react to it, is to combine them directly with agroecological approaches. And Pioneer has now um, launched a major partnership with the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership to develop um, combined approaches uh, of integrating trees, particularly fertilizer trees that are indigenous to Africa, have a strong science base, right into their expansion efforts w with hybrid seeds. And we're experimenting with those combined approaches to get, uh, to, to perhaps deflect a bit of the uh, problem of acceptance of these modern technologies. A any comments from the panel? Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, oh, Kawonga from uh, Sandy, Southern Africa Development Community. The issue of uh, civil society as as development partner is well understood. The issue that I'm afraid is that uh, coming from Ghana would also come to Southern Africa, which uh, does not take hybrid as hybrid seed as a tool to increase productivity, but it is being said as a no-no, uh, taking us back to whatever kind of seed which we, 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 we've been using in the past. I think the point that has been raised, which I want to echo, is that we have to sit as scientists from our regions and come up with an effective tool to, uh, to, 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 to impart to, to the, our colleagues in the civil society, the importance of hybrid seed in our development and production capacity. So surely we have to meet, and I would be one of those who would like to meet with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I see Mike. Can we? I know this issue is going to come up later, but some of us are not Introduce going to. Introduce yourself. I'm sorry. My name is Mike Harvey from USAID Nigeria. I know this issue is going to come up later, but I wanted to raise it now for those of us who are leaving early. I didn't hear the panel talk much about, and I would like to understand better, how we're bringing private sector uh, partners into this, especially the big, the big boys who can really sort of help us with development of both technologies and practices. Because I didn't, that didn't come out yet, and I'd like to hear a little bit more. Uh, the Minister of Science, anyone do you want to? Sure, I, I, can, I can start, Mike. Thank you. Look, I think. There's two or three things I'd highlight. One is uh, when Jada and Jonathan and others kind of pulled together the, the underpinnings of the new alliance that they'd created around the Camp David meeting. Uh, the, the big insight there was despite all this great progress in Feed the Future and in public investment, we were not seeing enough parallel private investment in the specific places we were focused in. So one vehicle for getting that done, particularly in Africa, is the Grow Africa partnership that is designed to allow companies to articulate what policy reforms are required to make further investments and for countries to articulate that they're making those reforms and coming up with ways like the Agricultural Transformation Agency in Ethiopia to smooth the pathway for, for private investment. Drive Masiwa is here in, as the, the chair of the Grow Africa partnership in addition to AGRA and I think it's, uh, it's an important model that can be replicated. The two things I'd, I'd take away as learnings for our teams uh, around the world. One is I hope our missions are as active as possible in reaching out to and inviting in local and international business partners to feed the future. And I think we've found that when we can provide a small amount of funding in a partnership, that really gets things going, even if it's not a significant financial investment. It just provides private partners with the confidence that they're standing with a partner like USAID that will be able to protect their investment should that become necessary. And the second is a lot of what I've seen work in Bangladesh and elsewhere 
is our ability to connect private companies to the NGO partners or contract partners that are out there doing that last mile reach to small farmers, whether it's through farmers organizations or otherwise. So Beta and, and others have built these amazing platforms that can make those connections. And the more you can play that role as a facilitator, the more effective I think we're gonna be at, at getting these firms in, in the game in a way that is effective at improving smallholder women and sons and outcomes. Ken, and MCC has a lot of experience. <coughs> yeah, um, three quick points. One, I think uh, whether it's the high investment in the scientific uh, side of the problem, <coughs> excuse me, or, or anything related to that, I think we have to have almost a relentless focus on evidence-based investment. This momentum that we have going will not last if we started just investing because something sounds good. We need to be very focused on what evidence do we see that it will deliver the kinds of results we want. On um, private sector specifically, you know, if you have private sector coming in behind an investment you made, that's a very good sign that there is somebody out there who believes that this is the right path. And so this is how at MCC we really look at uh, what we do. We look at our own model. Do we meet our hurdle rate in terms of economic rate of return? And then do we have people interested in falling behind us in, into that space? The second thing I would say is on uh, private sector, we need to go beyond you know, introduction and connecting the, the nodes is very, very critical role that we play. But a time comes when you have to actually develop the investment vehicle which the private sector can actually evaluate and say, yes, I, will, I can invest in this, or no, this is not ready for me. And I think we need to start channeling some investment towards creating these investment vehicle. Uh, at MCC, we certainly are now looking very seriously at building that into our compact design. And the third and last thing on private sector, I would say is that to get private sector interested and engaged is, is one thing, but to sustain it is also important. So we spent a lot of um, investment or, or grants on cadastres and land uh, issues, uh, clarifying issues related to land and irrigation because it brings in predictability in the agriculture business model. And without that predictability, it's very difficult for people to invest real money uh, for long periods of time. So we need to think about policy reform, but also policy reform that makes the, as uh, <coughs> Raj had mentioned earlier, makes the agriculture business a real business that people can rely upon and, and invest on. Thank you. I would just like to point out from a, a practical experience, uh, I couldn't agree more with what Cameron and, and Raj have said about policy reform. And of course, this is sound science-based policy reform. For three years, uh, we worked in Mozambique with the Ministry of Science and Technology looking at their investment codes uh, small, you know, small lines in page after page of document uh, that were necessary to be changed in order for a well-known global agribusiness to invest. And with that one investment gesture, it would have meant uh, millions of low-resource farmers would have been catapulted, literally. So I'm happy to say that that... Uh, that legislation is in place and, it, and the investment is forthcoming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jimmy Adam. I'm the executive secretary of SEALS uh, based in Burkina Faso. Uh, there is an issue that I just want to bring to the table. We may not necessarily want to deal with it now, but it needs to be this into the, the current thinking. Youth employment. Mm. There are at the minimum 150 to 200 thousand kids come out from schools with diplomas and looking for job in each of the at least the 13 countries that make up SILS. And so we need to very quickly figure out in by modernizing, pulling farmers out of poverty by modernizing the sector, how can we create jobs so that this is a ticking bomb basically. You know. the, it used to be the poor farmers are the target. Now we have this group on our hands, 
and five to ten years from now, if uh, business as usual continues, then we don't have to be so efficient. Thank you. You know, we agree with you, and on Wednesday afternoon, there will be a major focus on youth, but we should also ch challenge our panelists to talk about it earlier. So does, would anyone like to, to say anything about it now? I, I, I think the, the point's, of course, so well taken. The, I, I'm a product of kind of a, a, a long generation of farmers and uh, other farmers and, and basically kind of graduating out of farming. Uh, not, I'd love to be in it, but it's a, you know, it's a farms uh, as they get smaller and smaller, as we see in many of the African countries, too. And so what we've got to do, and we've seen kind of the enabling environment that creates a, a kind of the, the, the kind of an, a, a climate for additional investment that comes in, that for light manufacturing, that takes some of these, these farm boys or farm girls off the farm to do, you know, and, and create jobs for them, alternatives. I think the one point I'd like, like to make on resilience again, and, and what we see, particularly in these large pastoral areas of, 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 of Ethiopia, is that what after the last drought, we see a lot of the folks that lost their herds and really are just stuck there. And, and it's something you've seen, I think, in just coming, go back from Ethiopia and, and trying to transition some of these out of pastoralism. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, we, we, wanna, we wanna continue to support pastoralism, but some of them simply cannot make it any longer with no, no having no herds any longer. So giving them some of the skills training, the, the, the kind of light skills training to, to create uh, jobs in some of these market towns around the pastoral areas is something that we're really focusing on doing in a very practical way of, of, of our resilience agenda as well. Um, uh, can I get a microphone up front? Yes, yes go ahead. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yes. My name is Angela Duncan from uh, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana. Uh, before I make my substantive comment, uh, I just want to make a passing comment on the issue of seed. <laughs> I couldn't have agreed with the suggestion that uh, we need to work more with the local institutions uh, in the countries uh, to tackle the issue of genetically uh, engineered seeds. It has been a waging battle. Uh, as the representatives from Ghana here are aware, it has been a waging battle for the past six months. And uh, the parliament, our minister, uh, minister of uh, Food and Agriculture, the deputy ministers have been on air fighting against uh, the other side. Uh, so I'm sure if we get some more engagement and dialogue at the local level involving all the institutions, we may be able to make a headway. But more on my substantive comments. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very excited about the key words that I heard this morning about being strategic, about partnership, about focusing, and about working smarter. I think that is the way we should go. Because all the challenges of agricultural sector we have known over the past decades. And it's good that we are coming up, up with programs through the CADEP and what have you. But we cannot make a headway if we really don't take partnership seriously. And that is why I'm happy that in Ghana, uh, with leadership uh, of USAID, uh, particularly in fact we hold our donor coordination meetings in the USAID office, and they are championing the partnership uh, in Ghana. I couldn't have uh, agreed with uh, Michelle or Cheryl uh, while she was there. Yes, she really went through trouble doing the project with, uh, with the World Bank. And I was involved at one point and off. It took five years before we did that project. But that is not to say it's a bad way. I mean, good things take long to come, to materialize. That is the way to go. And we are encouraging the partners, in fact, in all countries and in Ghana in particular, that we need to focus on the country priorities. You said cannot handle the soft aspects, leaving the hardware for somebody else to do. Government doesn't have the money. For years now, we've been talking about infrastructure being the gap. And so if everybody takes the soft parts, which includes holding workshops and doing what have you, and leave the infrastructure, there's no way we can do. We can move ahead. So there are resources, but we must apply these resources in a more, most effective way that can really address where we can leverage private sector investment and we can make an impact from poverty. Thank you very much. Minister, Minister Carla Bartos, can we have a microphone? Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, yeah. My name is Agnes Kalibata. I'm from uh, Minister of Agriculture from Rwanda. So I was looking around when they were talking about all this stuff that's happening in Nigeria, and I felt a responsibility to defend the Minister of Agriculture from Nigeria since I don't see him here. <laughs> so, so, or not to defend, but to, to speak about the situation from a, a, a leadership perspective on the continent. 
And this is my take, especially on what people are saying on seeds, um, GMO, uh, hybrids, and, and, and stuff. <coughs> I think on the continent, there are a number of things, again, coming from businesses, coming from trade issues that may not be right. People are trying to promote all sorts of things. And hybrid <coughs> seed and genetic modified seed and whatever is going to go hand in hand. So we have to be aware of this. But I think Peter put it right. We need to build capacities and skills for people to make the decisions of what they want to do. There's, we cannot question what is happening here in terms of giving people the productive means, either through improved seeds or through GMOs. The question is what's going to be right for which situation. Uh, we were having a meeting at African Union the other day and we have made it, we have made it a requirement, us the ministers required our president to focus on productivity as part of going forward in the African year of agriculture. And it's going to be those two. It's going to be improved, I mean, uh, hybrid seed, it's going to be GMOs, depending on your speci specific situation. Maybe what the Feed the Future can help people do going forward is give them the capacity on biosafety, because that's the concern. The concern is biosafety issues. To be able to tell what is right when under what conditions. So, so that countries can have the capacity to, to feel comfortable. Yes, if I pick GMO stuff, A, B, C, D, this, these are my limits, this is where I'm going, and this is where I'm going to fall back to. I think the lack of knowledge on this topic is what is creating the phobia against GMOs. And we need to start thinking about how to build capacity so that countries can make informed decisions. I face it with um, fertilizers. People are saying, oh, inorganic fertilizers, are killing the soil. I live with that every day. And I just have to put my foot down and say, here we are doing the right thing and we are going to defend it. Or here we are doing the wrong thing and we will stop it. So, so again, equipping policymakers with the right capacities and right knowledge to make these decisions will go a long, long way to help these debates. But the debates will always be there. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one to two more questions. Unfortunately, whoever has the microphone will win. <laughs> Just please keep, keep going. Good morning, everyone. My name is Omoyele Ajoyo. I come from the USAID Benin mission. Kevin Armstrong, the mission director, wanted to be here today, but couldn't be. And uh, I don't know if there's any other country in our situation here in the room, but Benin doesn't have Feed the Future Fund. So I'm here to find out how we can get on <laughs> with this. <laughs> Because um, the, part, the northern part of Benin is part of the Sahel. And the latest study on food security in Benin shows that only 55% of the population has food security. So this is a critical issue. And re we really want and need to be involved. And we just need guidance as to how to get there so that we can start having the problems and the debates that all of you are talking about in terms of <laughs> choices of fertilizers and <laughs> genetically engineered food and so on. So any assistance with that will be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I will. I will. So we're, we're honored to have Benin as part of the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. So there, there's been some support. And Benin is also one of the focus countries for resilience through the Sahel, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, we, we try to integrate our programming as much as possible. Part of the focus and concentrate meant that not every country could get the full uh, suite of Feed the Future funds, but the Bureau for Food Security is there to support you, and, and we look, we are happy to work with um, other funds for your economic growth portfolio or resilience or other things to make sure that you get the integrated support that you need. Well, B Bid is being very nice <laughs> and is saying that, you know, it's hard to uh, be able to fully fund every deserving partner. Uh, and when I say deserving, I mean countries like Benin that have dramatically increased at great expense the percentage of the public budget on agriculture that have really made tough policy reform commitments to attract private investment. I think my, my message, and I suspect Ambassador Lane will speak to this a little bit uh, when, during his panel, uh, my message is, and why I wanted all the mission directors here, whether you're in a feed the future country or not, this new model is working. I know it is extraordinarily hard to implement. I, my uh, thoughts go out to Jada and Jonathan and others that are coordinating a genuinely interagency effort because frankly, that's really, really tough. And I know for all of the mission directors in country, 
that's very, very tough. But I hope you sense from this, and Minister Calvada's comments, you know, when we are operating in a country-led environment, when countries are making tough policy reforms, when all of the tools of the American government are slowly but surely coming around to tackle a difficult problem, um, and when that system works, we should have the resources to fund everybody fully. And that's not gonna happen this year, it's not gonna happen next year, but I hope one of the outcomes of this meeting, and I hope one of the points of focus for today's reception on Capitol Hill is to make the point that, uh, that like you know, big success stories in the past for American engagement in the world, like PEPFAR, this program should be funded at three, four, five times the level that it's currently funded at. And it may take a while to get there. It may not even be appropriate to say, because it's not in the president's <laughs> budget at that level. But nevertheless, if we're gonna end <laughs> hunger and poverty, we need to now put a political engine under the extraordinarily cooperative and effective approach that you all in this room have taken together. And, and I would like every one of our mission directors to kind of fight for that year after year. I want everyone from every agency to be on the Hill making that case. And, and I very much hope that this administration, but, but really the ones that come after it, because President Obama has shown his commitment, continue to live up to the high standards you all have set together. So it's a, not a great answer for Benin right now. <laughs> But if we do our work together as a team, and if we show the world this interagency approach works, I suspect it could be very successful in the future. Thank you. <laughs> we, are, we are short on time. I, did, I, we promised, I promised there'd be one final question. If you don't mind, we're probably only able to respond, to have one response to it, but please. My name is Marjorie Abdeen. I'm representing the private sector in Ghana. Raj, I heard you make mention of the fact that uh, we may need to bring Grow Africa into feed the Feed the Future program. Um, Ghana's experience with Grow Africa has, has been quite disappointing. Um, we started with uh, six signatories three years ago. It shrunk to three at Cape Town last year. Um, this year in Abuja, there were two one of the six that initially signed, and a new one that really Ghana is not too interested in, in them coming to Ghana. Um, just last week, I was speaking to an official from USAID Ghana, and I expressed my disappointment. <coughs> Grow Africa is an excellent initiative. And my question was, why were the numbers of companies interested in Ghana shrinking? And the response was that it was for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to generate the, in, uh, the interest in multinationals to come to Ghana. And I found that rather surprising because just like you mentioned earlier, I thought Grow Africa was the vehicle to generate that interest in African countries and were to act as an intermediary, you know, to sort out challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me that there's a, misund a misunderstanding, a disconnect as to what exactly Grow Africa should be doing for the private sector in the African countries. And Ghana needs to know exactly what is the matter. Is there something we're doing wrong in Ghana? Is there anything we can do to make ourselves more attractive to these multinationals who want to come and invest in Ghana? And what steps do we need to take to increase the numbers who are coming to Ghana wanting to invest? Okay. Anyone? Anyone over So Grow Africa is a partnership, right? It, it, it's, it's a partnership that is deeply involves the country. So the government of Ghana is very much a part of that, that conversation um, with the African Union and NEPAD. So uh, the Grow Africa, the, the partners there look to mobilize countries. But at the end of the day, it really is about that partnership between the country um, and the, the, the private sector partners, both local and multinational partners. And I think that's one of the strengths of, of Grow Africa and the initiative is that it is local and multinational. So as a member of the Ghana's private sector, you're, you're part of that ambassador crew to help other companies see the vision um, and see the potential. And hopefully the Grow Africa Forum gives Ghana a platform to position itself and to attract that investment. Um, and, and like I said, it is a two-way partnership. I, I don't want to speak for Grow Africa, well, but. Let, let me just add to that, to that answer that Mr. Gladwin gave at the outset. But the bottom line is, you know, I've been surprised, frankly, by the success of Grow Africa in the short amount of time. 
because we've seen a big increase in the number of countries and the number of companies that have joined that partnership, made commitments, and, and tracked that. Uh, we have also learned about what works and what doesn't work in country after country, and, and this actually really surprised me. The ability for a country to create a very efficient, problem-solving oriented platform to accelerate making these investments real. The uh, Ethiopian Agricultural Transformation Agency is often cited as the best practice, but the Tanzanian SAGCOT Agency is also seen as such, has, in my view, become essential for countries to, frankly, compete for you know, the limited attention and resources that multinationals offer. Uh, so uh, you know, that would be something to look at and think about as, as you go into this. The other thing I just highlight is one of the things I want to make sure we do is communicate that Grow Africa is really as much or more about local companies having a platform to insist on certain policy reforms so they can drive growth and investment as it is a platform for multinationals. Uh, and so when I look through the Grow Africa report, which came out just a week and a half ago, uh, there's a pretty detailed Ghana section, as I'm sure you're well aware. Uh, and uh, I'm just pleased to see significant local company involvement, because in my view, we've almost, uh, we have too much of an association with the multinationals. And it's frankly the local companies that are driving investment and smallholder productivity in a more aggressive and more meaningful manner. And the platform exists to help raise their voice and insist they get the respect, reforms, and government performance they need to be successful. So that's not a very specific answer, but I, I hope you'll have a chance to talk to Strive also and, and that we collectively can do more. The final thought I'd just make is Feed the Future only works if everybody's participating. So I know there are a lot of discussions about what's part of Feed the Future and what's not. I would urge you to use the, the least formal definition possible and embrace uh, pretty much anything that's working to <laughs> accelerate agricultural development <laughs> and improve women's incomes in the smallholder farm sector. Thank you. I want to say, give a big thank you to our panelists on this panel. It's been tremendous. <laughs> and, and thank you for that very, very lively and fun question and answer session.